I get lots of requests to address a particular topic of interest to my viewers. None has come up more often and with greater frequency than GMOs. What people really want to know about is genetically modified food crops. I first want to say that I have a slight conflict of interest here. The biotech company that employs me doesn't make any GMO products, but they do make some of the tests for screening food products for GMOs. This is one of the reasons I've been somewhat reluctant to address this topic. I'm in a completely different division, but my company might benefit from increased demand for GMO screening of food products. Fair warning. The term Frankenfood describes very accurately how some people think about transgenic crops. Science gone amuck, tampering with nature in an amoral way, driven by greed and hubris. The reality is a bit more complex. While some manufacturers are seeking ways to increase profits through DNA technology, others are developing some very important modifications that nature is either too slow or unwilling to do for us. I'm going to do this as a pros and cons list because it is such a complex topic. Some examples of positive applications. Drought resistant crops. While humans have been using artificial means to select for certain traits in our food crops for thousands of years, it's only in the last two decades that we finally have the technology to directly select the gene variants we like, allowing us to bypass certain natural limitations on what traits can be expressed together. One such innovation is drought resistance, or low water usage crops that are sustainable and can provide adequate nutrition. An example is a variety of maize that outproduces the wild type by 40% during extended droughts. Imagine the impact this could have for world starvation and poverty. Pathogen resistant crops. This is the largest commercial application for transgenics. Roundup Ready varieties are resistant to herbicides that kill weeds that don't have the transgene. The reason this is a good thing is that the weeds use water, so weedless fields are more water efficient. There are also varieties of corn and soy that have genes for natural pesticides, normally found in the bacteria that colonizes plants and caterpillars. This reduces the amount of expensive and harmful pesticide that must be used to prevent crop loss. High yield crops. The general global trend towards urbanization means that people are getting further from the crops that sustain them. This requires more transportation and infrastructure, which consumes more resources and causes greater environmental impact. The more food we can produce per acre, the shorter the transport distance required. Higher yields also keep the cost of food low and the availability high, so that people can afford to eat healthy, nourishing meals and stave off hunger and disease. Growth of agricultural land usually has a negative impact on the local indigenous environment, so transgenic high-yield crops can have a positive impact on the environment as well. Edible vaccines. If I made a Venn diagram of anti-vaccine and anti-GMO activists, I suspect there's not going to be a lot of non-overlap, so they're going to love this application. Progress is being made on introducing vaccines into plants, especially fruits, although potatoes are also very useful. The idea is that they would be an incredibly cheap, easy to transport, and easy to administer way of vaccinating populations in remote areas or areas affected by poverty and infrastructure problems. Green production. One of the possible alternatives to oil is biomass or plant energy production. Former President Bush advocated for switchgrass cellulosic ethanol production, a resource that could be cheaply harvested and would provide a seamless near-term solution to our dependence on petroleum. There's only one problem. The conversion of cellulose to ethanol isn't very efficient. Enter biotechnology. Cellulose hydrolysis is the current rate-limiting step. We can enhance that process with enzymes called cellulases that split apart the long chains of cellulose into short sugars. Introducing that enhanced cellulose pathway into a bacteria may result in bioreactors that eat lawn clippings and generate biofuels. So that's the potential upside of GMOs. What about the objections to genetic engineering of food crops? I'll break it down and rank the various objections by the amount of logical value I see in them, lowest to highest. Moral or religious objections. We're playing God. The reason I rank this the lowest is that we've been playing God for over a thousand years. Other animals have too. Insects are the reason some plants make flowers. We eat the sweetest berries. We harvest the largest seeds. The plants with those genes get favored by a broader dispersal. 
We are an agent of selection, which plays into the process of evolution that began over 2.8 billion years ago. Today we are the weather, the ecology, and the fitness landscape. But that's just plants. The issue that makes people a bit more squeamish is modifying animals. The Enviropig has been selected for its reduced phosphate excretion. This is both less smelly and better for the environment, although it raises questions about our role as stewards of our planet. We've been modifying wild animals by the same processes of selective breeding, so that we've produced the Chihuahua from the wolf lineage. These selectively bred animals have health problems, of course, but a wolf won't guard sheep or help serve lost children or drug shipments. There's a difference between breeding a trait over a thousand years and producing it in a year in a lab, but I want to react to specific evidence in actual cases, not hand-waving and fear-mongering. There may be some cases where genetic modification can save lives, improve living conditions, and minimize our environmental impact. There may also be cases that really are endangering our ecosystem. Safety of consumption. I can see why this is a very common objection to GMO. We have very little data what the effects of introducing foreign DNA and proteins into a food crop will be on our health. However, there's little evidence to suggest that GMO crops don't have the same level of nutrient content. A classic example is the flavor saver tomato. Scientists inactivated a gene product that degrades pectin in the tomato, allowing it to reach market without softening or rotting. It's a matter of turning off a product currently being made by the tomato rather than adding a new protein. Some describe the flavor as bad, but that may have more to do with the particular tomato that they chose to modify rather than the genetic modification itself. More recent revisions are still being sold as premium hothouse tomatoes. Outcrossing or contamination of wild strains. There is a risk that whatever modification we make to a crop will be transferred to another non-crop plant. There is some evidence that this is possible, but no confirmation that it has occurred in the wild, so to speak. 90% of the U.S. soybean crop and 70% of the corn crop contain the Roundup Ready transgene. We've seen the evolution of resistance in weeds, but it's not a match with the introduced transgene sequence. So it appears that overuse of Roundup, and not the GMO itself, is the bigger threat. I think you can make a reasonable case that this is an indirect cause, because farmers can be indiscriminate in their spraying. Environmental Consequences A possible consequence of high-yield GMO varieties is the same as a non-GMO high-yield variety, and that is soil depletion. The more that plants are able to take out of the soil, the more we have to put back in. It also means a more tempting food source for the insect or pathogen that can exploit it. That means water, fertilizer, insecticide, herbicide, fungicide, and other chemical preventatives. I'm describing what's called in agricultural circles the scale-up problem. The more yield you get, the more chemicals you need. I think this is a very serious risk for developing nations that are desperate to equalize the trade imbalance with agricultural superpowers like the U.S. It can contribute to serious, permanent ecological damage. As I mentioned, I think GMO, or at least selective breeding, can also be the solution to this problem, but it won't come without a radical change in the way we conduct agriculture around the world. Corporatization of food crops. This is, I think, the scariest and most real of the concerns about GMO crops. Corporations are amoral. That is, they do not have a moral system. They simply make the decision that most benefits them. If they don't, their competitor does and beats them. So we shouldn't look to corporations to be self-regulating in a vacuum. We need either an informed moral consumer or an informed moral regulatory agency to intervene, to set limits. That's why I think criticism of crop tech giant Monsanto is a little out of place. Of course, they will do terrible things if it's very profitable for them. But when they're allowed to do these things, I view it as a regulatory failure, not a failure of the technology or the company. Protesting Monsanto, while it's going to make you feel good, probably won't do much to their policies. I think it's better to focus on smarter regulations and consumer education, and ultimately we need to reform the campaign finance system. In my humble opinion, the best thing that could happen would be a worldwide promotion of locally adapted crops and a serious reconsideration of what I see as the greatest sin in global agriculture, monocropping. 
there's too much wheat, corn, and soy in production in places where it barely grows. Not enough teff, millet, cowpeas, and yam. That's because the market for these commodities are not as strong. But it hurts farmers in areas where the cash crops don't have good yields. Here's my final thought on the matter. I worry that rich white people in the first world tend to focus on the possible effects GMOs will have on them at the cost of death, disease, and poverty in other parts of the world. There's a certain smugness about going to the farmer's market and buying organic locally grown hobby garden products. It's right to be concerned about possible allergy or fertility or toxic effects in humans or the population of the monarch butterfly, but contrast that with the 16,000 children who die every day of starvation, the 1 billion people who go to bed hungry every day. I don't have all the answers on this issue, but I know whatever solution we follow, it needs to give consideration to butterflies, rich white people, but also the suffering and starvation in the world. We need to find the best and most ethical path, and the only way to do that is from a rational human perspective. Thanks for watching.